But um, we're going to review a little bit of what we talked about last week, and then we'll be in Jeremiah 31, 32, 33, and there a little bit. But we're talking about uh, covenants. Maybe just turn the, the, maybe just the floods off, or a little, we want people to be able to see. Um, that, let's just leave it like that. Can you see that all right? You good? So you can see your Bibles good. Um, we're talking about, about covenants. A covenant is a promise. It's an agreement between God and man. And the, the word you'll, you're, you would be surprised how often the word covenant comes up in the Bible. Uh, we just read our Bibles and, and, and we learn, but sometimes we don't realize how significant certain things are. And so we're just going to take some key things. So uh, God makes some agreements or covenants. Let's go to the next one. And this is just a review from last week. Uh, there's the covenant in the garden. And actually, some of you that are more theological, you know, there's probably something before the fall and a different one after, and I'm blurring them together. Uh, I would like to point out that I had no idea. Um, I've, I used this last week. I studied and prepared, and I didn't realize what I was looking. Do you see the two faces? There's a face on that side, a chin on both sides, eyes, little teardrops. And Now, in the Bible study this afternoon at 3.30, I said that. I said, I, I taught this last week. I didn't even know those faces were there. And Keith Johnson says, I still don't see any faces. <laughs> so we took a vote. How many saw it last week? How many see it now? How many don't see it at all? And it's all a matter of perception. But anyway, so the blurring the time in the garden, God made an agreement, a deal. You, the day you eat of that fruit, you're going to die. Now, they didn't die physically. There's a body and a soul and a spirit. And uh, important lessons to understand the spirit. Um, the spirit died in the Garden of Eden, and the body and the soul were still there. They could still talk. They could still enjoy food. They can still have a family. They could still love and care. But the spiritual part died, and that's why Jesus said in John 3, you must be born again, born from God. There needs to be the new birth. Peter said, uh, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So the new person, the new birth is a spiritual birth. And this spiritual birth takes place. And that's why when your body dies, you're fine. Because this new person that was born inside you can never die. This new person is eternal. Why? Because it's got an eternal book and an eternal father. And we're born again of that, of God and his seed. And so this is, this body has got a temporal father, an earthly father that, that brought sin into the world. And my earthly father passed that sinful nature on to me. Uh, but my new birth I got when I was 18 uh, on my way to college, that was th that new guy. He's safe. See, that's why you can't lose your salvation because this new guy was born of God. Amen. This is a whole new eternal creature. And uh, when you put your faith in Christ, you are born again and uh, he that uh, believeth on me shall never die, Jesus said in John 11. So uh, there's a, a, and the word covenant is not there, so don't spend a lot of time on it, but I think it's a good start. So let's go to the next one. And then we, and okay, I'm sorry, in the garden, uh, what happened as a result of that death? Pain and childbearing should not have been there. That was not God's intent. Loss of position. There was a position, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, the earth was cursed. There's physical labor, physical death. And we'll come back to some of those. Let's go to the next one. The second covenant we could talk about tonight, or we talked about last week, the, Noah, the covenant with Noah, that God said, I'll never curse the land again. Now, we're going to look at these verses briefly. Um, but that, that's the first. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, in, uh, we'll see in Genesis chapter 9, the word covenant is used, I think, seven times in that chapter. And he just said, I'm not going to curse the ground again. All right, go on to the next one. The third and uh, this is uh, important. This is an, uh, uh, Ab covenant with Abraham, an unconditional promise. He said, you, the, the seed of Abraham, uh, you're going to inherit this land, this dirt, this piece of land here, and not in Wildemar, but in, in the land of Canaan, and it extends far beyond that. And then the other part of the covenant is your seed, your children, will be like the stars of heaven. And... Uh, there is a spiritual seed and a physical seed, obviously, if you read the Bible much, and uh, you don't want to get too confused on that, but we'll, we'll talk about Abraham next week, and that Abraham and Moses and David are the three you're going to see very, very influential in our New Testament doctrine. Go to the next one. There's a covenant that God gave to the people of Israel through Moses, 
we would call it the Ten Commandments, and the, that is conditional. Now, the, that the Israel, the people of Israel get Canaan, that's unconditional. I don't care what the Palestinians say or what the UN says or anybody else says, the, the Israelite people are going to get Canaan. They're going to get that piece of dirt. There's no way around it. As much as they want to try, the, the uh, remember, was it the Balfour? I was trying to remember today the Balfour um, agreement or covenant, whatever it was, that where they divided up the land of, of uh, Israel and gave so much to, and, that, and that got violated and changed in the, in the 60s, the Six-Day War and all that went on. As much as people try to mess with that land, the right people are going to get it because he's God. It's going to be all right. But the, the Mosaic covenant is conditional. You keep the law, you get to stay in the land. If you don't keep the law, I'm going to boot you out like you should do maybe children that don't obey. <laughs> Older children, all right, like 40-year-old kids. Um, you figure that out. So a conditional covenant, meaning, uh, see, uh, with Abraham, go back to Abraham. I just found out how easy it is for you guys to do this. Abraham got a promise of land. Remember, there was three L's we talked about last week. Abraham got the promise for the land. Go to the next one. And Moses brought the law. That's the law of the land. You ever heard that, the law of the land? I mean, that's, um, this is the law. And if you're going to stay in the land, you've got to keep the law. This is not to you. You are not Jews. You are not a part of the 12 tribes of Israel. We're not talking about you at all. These are covenants made between God and the, the, the seed of Abraham in Israel. So this is the law of the land. Go to the next one. And then you need a king in the land. Only we didn't want a K, we wanted an L, so we need a leader. So we got the land, and we got the law, and we got a leader, and the, an, an, another unconditional promise or a covenant that we'll look at in a couple of weeks that, that uh, David would have a son on the throne ruling. And, of course, that eventually is going to be Jesus, right? There's another one. Go to the next. We got a new covenant, a new testament. Jesus said, this is the new testament in my blood, a new testament or a new covenant. This is a brand new thing. And it is a conditional covenant because if you don't put your faith in Christ, you get none of the benefits. If you'll put your faith in Christ, then, you could, then you're saved and you're in on it. So what if, you know, I don't know how good I have to be. None of us are any good, all right? Just get over that. This crowd of people who say you got to be good, I want to look, look at them and say, let's go look in the mirror. And you look in the mirror, look at yourself and look, in the, look yourself in the eye and tell me, tell yourself you're good enough. We're not good enough. The, the very, it's just really ridiculous to think I could be good enough to merit heaven. That's a ridiculous thought. That's why Jesus had to die, because we were all as an unclean thing. And our iniquities like the wind have taken us away, and, and uh, there's none righteous, no, not one. So when I put my faith in Christ, that's what the cross is all about, then I get to be a part of that new testament, or that new covenant. Then one more, and there's, I realize there's some others, you that study a lot of this is a real overview. We've got an eternal covenant. We'll look a little bit at this tonight, but it'll be three or four weeks away. The, this covenant is twofold, one with the bride of Christ. That's the believers today. We move into the new Jerusalem, and that's not a real picture. We got that off Facebook. No, I have no idea where it came from. Uh, I, it, it's probably not going to look like that. But anyway, it is going to come down from God. The Jews get an earthly kingdom. The bride gets a, a, the new Jerusalem. And, and again, we'll, we'll talk about some misconceptions we get because we watch cartoons too much when we were kids. But, but this is an eternal thing, all right? And with all that in mind, do you have the one that's got the, the list of them on there, Johnny? There you go. Um, you can just leave that up for the moment. Let's look at some scripture together. Uh, look with me if you would. Uh, let's go over to, uh, to Jeremiah and uh, see if we can't start there. Jeremiah chapter 31. And, and if some of this doesn't, if it if goes over your head, don't worry about it. This is just one of the things I love about the Bible. I got saved on a Wednesday night. On Saturday night, four days later, I picked up a Bible in a motel by myself. I probably read for two hours, and, um, and, I, and I, I loved it. I thought, this is my book for life. I, rem I don't remember what I read. I just remember that Gideon's Bible in that motel room, and I remember thinking, this is what I want for the rest of my life. It's the thing... And, and the day I picked that Bible up for the first time, I got something out of it. And I, and, the very, and I knew nothing. I knew nothing about the Word of God. I remember that year reading my Bible, just, just devouring it in a, in a secular college. And I remember thinking, 
hey, this guy, Matthew, he knew that guy, Mark. And John, they all were together. That's how little Bible I knew. That was a revelation to me. And, um, and I loved it. That, the, this book spoke to my heart. Why? Because it's a spiritual book, and the Spirit of God teaches you. So 45 years or whatever, how many years since 1975, I've been reading this every day since that Saturday night, and it still speaks to me, and it's still amazing. And you don't ever want to get where, where it gets dry. Now, Ezekiel and Numbers and Leviticus can seem a little dry, but that's why you keep reading in different places. But uh, it's a wonderful book, and don't feel like you've got to understand everything all, all at once. I'll do my best to answer questions if you ask. But let's look at some things. Jeremiah 31. All right, look at uh, verse 31, chapter 31, verse 31. Behold, the days come... Jeremiah 31, 31, all right, you there? Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a what kind of covenant? A new covenant. So there is a day coming when he's going to make a new covenant. Now, Jeremiah is, um, during the Assyrian captivity and during much of the Babylonian captivity, so this is after Eden, after Noah, after Moses, after Abraham, after David, this is way down the road when these covenants were being put into place. And he says, it'll come to pass uh, after these things, I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And I remember in the, the nation of Israel shaped like this. Israel is the, when, they, when the nation split, um, the top was called Israel, the bottom was called Judah. So he's referring to both of them there in, in verse uh, 31. I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Now stop for a minute. Let's think back to our covenants. You've got the Garden of Eden. You've got Noah. You've got Abraham was for land and Moses was for law and David was for the leader or king. And so he says, I'm going to make a new covenant with you not like the covenant I made with you when I took you by the hand and led you out of Egypt. So picture, you just got that timeline of covenants. And covenants, so again, they overlap. When, what covenant would he be talking about, the, like the covenant when, when God led them out of Egypt? Be Moses, Mount Sinai. Remember, God led them across the Red Sea, uh, down to Sinai. And up there, they, had the, they got the commandments up on Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments. And before they even, before Moses got down, they'd already violated the commandments. Why John 3, 16? I don't know. It's just an amazing God that we serve. So this, this covenant, he says, I'm giving you a new covenant, verse 32, not according to the covenant I made with, the, with their fathers. This is total, this is not thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. I got something way better. I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Look at the end of verse 32, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. I, I, what could you get better than me, he says, and then you break my law, verse 33. But this shall be the covenant. So this is this new covenant. This shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. And notice there he puts Israel and Judah together. That's prophetic. Um, after those days, and when you see that phrase, you need to consider something. There's, that's after. That's down the road. We're gonna, we'll just throw it out there into that last covenant, the eternal covenant. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Now what you see in verse 33 and 34, I won't go into detail with it, but there is such a blurring of the bride and Israel, of the covenant with us, the bride, and the covenant there, and the very statement, their sins and iniquities will I remember no more, is right out of the book of Hebrews. You use that in soul winning, and it's not wrongly used at all, but literally it is a kingdom uh, prophecy or promise to Jewish people. 
And uh, if you want to really be there, you, you, there's, there's spiritual applications, there's principles, and then there's literal specific doctrine. And that's, that's literally what you read about there in Hebrews. That is a Jewish thing there. Um, so let's go just there at verse 33. This covenant, this new covenant, um, I'll put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. You know what? You and I are supposed to hide God's word in our heart, right? So this isn't talking about today. This is talking about after these things, there's a day coming God says, I'm going to put my word in your heart and you're going to be mine and I'll be yours and we're going to have this intimacy, this closeness. By the way, that's what he wanted way back here in the Garden of Eden. God wanted that every day walking with his people and loving his people right here. And, but their sin broke that relationship and so all these years God is rebuilding this situation and ultimately what there's going to be here is he's going to pick up where we messed it up only now he's going to do it with with the new birth and, and with the nation of Israel totally different so you see this is this is a he said not like the covenant you got from Moses this is going to be a new covenant so on our list there we don't even go past the Davidic covenant what good is that never mind go can you go back one slide to the to the uh, fabricated, there's the, this is the new Jerusalem. This is Jesus will be ruling on the earth. The, literally the sea of, the Dead Sea will be healed from a river flowing out of the throne of the Lord. It says they'll catch fish that just match the fish in the Mediterranean Sea. The river will flow both directions out of Jerusalem to the Mediterranean to the Dead Sea. It's going to be a plush garden there and Jesus will rule from there. And then the new Jerusalem, you and I are going to reign and rule. And so this is, you're not going to be sitting in white tights with wings and a halo and a harp floating on a cloud. And that is, that is only on Casper, the friendly ghost. So look over with this. And again, we're going to do a little bit on this. This is just, I want you to see a little bit of where we're going because Genesis, the Noah and, and the garden are pretty simple. Flip over to chapter 34 or 32, just one page over, Je, uh, Jeremiah 32. Look at Jeremiah 32 and verse 38. And each week I'm going to try and point you to some things to help you realize these covenants are very important to God. And he writes about them over and over and over. And, and like the Abrahamic covenant about land, you'll see that that is constantly through the scriptures. You'll be amazed how many times in the Bible God says it's about the land. And then you get up in the New Testament and they say, yeah, that promise for land and they're looking back to it. It's, it's huge. And the Jews knew that. Look at um, uh, chapter 32, verse 37. That, Jeremiah 32, 37. Behold, I will gather them out of all countries, whither I have driven them in mine anger. Now, the Jews today are everywhere. I heard not long ago, and this is a few years ago, that there were more Jews in New York than in Israel. And I'm not sure that's still the case, but, but we'll just say this. The Jews are everywhere. God literally drove the Jews out of, of Israel because of their sin. You can't have the land without the law. You can't live there and not be a part of that covenant relationship. Um, but God says, I'm going to make a new covenant. We're going to get you guys back. We're going to just like, just like you and I can be saved by the blood of Christ. There's a new covenant he's making there, and we'll get to that down the road. So look at verse 37 again. Uh, I'll gather them out of the countries whither I have driven them in mine anger and in my fury and in great wrath, and I will bring them again to this place, and I will cause them to dwell safely, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Now, again, we're not going to turn to it, but doesn't that sound like, like a promise in Corinthians? Sure. There are so many promises to Israel and promises to, to the church, and that's why people get them messed up. And they start thinking you're spiritual Israel and you're you're really a spiritual Jew and you're going to go through the tribulation and, and that's all, that's all haywire. But if they get their covenant straight and if they read their Bible more, they know better. Verse 38. And they shall be my people and I will be their God and I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and of their children. And I will make an what kind of covenant? everlasting covenant so this is not a temporary covenant it's not a short-lived thing what we're what the subject the covenant subject here in these verses this is that eternal kingdom we're looking at this covenant here is looking forward to the day when the lord's going to gather the jews out of all the nations bring them back to israel and give them that piece of dirt 
and give them that land, give them that law, and give them that leader, that king of kings, the son of David, and set that kingdom up on earth, and it is going to be forever and ever. And, uh, and let's just go on. Let's, uh, let me, I'm getting ahead of myself. Verse 40, I'll be at, make an everlasting covenant with them, and I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts, and they shall not depart from me. Yea, I will rejoice over them to do them good, and I will plant them in this what? <laughs> the land, in that land, all right? In this land, assuredly. Now look at this phrase. You don't see this. This is amazing. With all my heart, or with my heart, with my whole heart, and with my whole soul. To have God say, I'm going to do this with my whole heart and my whole soul. God's pretty serious about this thing. This is, you know, if I say to my wife, I love you with all my heart. You know what? They say that on Hallmark all the time. And, but when God says it, that's big stuff. For God to say, I'll do this with all my heart. How do you even say that? You know, God says in the great commandment, I want you to love me with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. So that means, means as much as I can, but that's not very much. Because if I love him with all my mind, that's really not very much. I love him with all my heart, this old frail heart of mine. But God turns to the Jewish people and say, I'm going to do this for you with all my heart. That's amazing. This is a very, very rich and deep commitment God's making to these people. Now, we're going to, we'll talk more about it with, with that in mind. Just one more verse before we get to Genesis. Look at Luke. If you can find Matthew, Mark, Luke. Look at Luke chapter 1. Uh, just uh, a quick verse about John the Baptist. Remember, Zacharias and Elizabeth couldn't have children. Elizabeth was Mary, Jesus' mother's cousin. And Zacharias is in the temple performing his priestly duties, and he sees an angel, and he said, your prayers are heard. That's a neat thing. He was still praying for a baby, and they were old. He didn't believe they could have a baby, and he was still praying. That's good prayer. You say, is it okay to pray if I don't really believe? I like that verse, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Uh, that song, just keep on praying until light breaks through. The Lord will answer. He'll answer you. God keeps his promise. His word is true. Just keep on praying till light breaks through. Now, uh, look at Luke, uh, Luke chapter 1, and uh, let's go toward the end there. Zacharias didn't believe the angel. The angel said, you're going to have a baby. And he said, nah, come on. Uh, like Abraham and Sarah both had an issue. And he said, all right, you're not going to speak until that baby's born. And so nine months, he couldn't talk. And the baby's born, and they say, what are you going to name him? And he writes on a tablet, well, we're going to call him John. And they said, what? Nobody in your family's named John. Let's call him Zacharias. No, his name's John. And then he could talk. And when he began to speak, he's, he brings a prophecy, and that's what we're looking at. Look at verse 67. And his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant who? They're always looking for the son of David. Remember when Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, the triumphal entry. Blessed be the son of David, which cometh in the name of the Lord. The Jews are looking for a land, and they're looking for the king. And you'll see that over and over in the weeks we look at it. Verse 70, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. And when we get to the Davidic covenant, we're going to look back and I'll show, we'll look at, we can't look at all of it. We'll look at a lot of them. The prophets over and over and over talked about this kingdom. Verse 71, that we should go to heaven. No, that's not what it says, is it? You know what the Jews were looking for? They're looking for a king and a kingdom. Verse 71, that we should be saved from our enemies. We've got to get these kingdoms and from the hand of all that hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. There's nothing about heaven, nothing about the blood, nothing about the resurrected Christ. The king is coming. The king is coming. We're going to get our land and we're going to get our king and we're going to kick these people out of our nation. That's what the Jews were hoping for and looking for. And uh, verse 73, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham. Now, the Bible interprets the Bible. So go to the end of verse 72 and to remember his what? 
holy covenant, semicolon, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham. And so he says, let me define the covenant. It's an oath. It's a promise. And again, you don't need a Greek or Hebrew lexicon. Just read your Bible and it'll start defining your words and you're not going to become an idiot by listening to people who don't believe the Bible. A bunch of amillennial uh, people denying the deity of Christ, writing books, getting rich so that Bible college students can have their faith shaken in their Bible. Um, verse 73, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham that he would grant unto us. So here's the oath that he swore to Abraham. Remember, we already looked at that Abrahamic covenant back there. Verse 74, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest. Talking about John the Baptist. Thou shalt go before the face of the Lord and on and on. Now, we're going to come back to that when we get down in the, uh, the, to the Abraham's, Abraham's covenant with Abraham. But uh, the people of Israel were looking for a king. They were looking for a king to come. They're looking for a land. They're looking for this incredible thing that they got a little glimpse of in the life of Solomon. Now, all that said, let's go back and take a moment and look at Genesis. Very familiar stuff. And, but just because we want to start there, and you find the word covenant seven times in one chapter, where in the book of, in all the Gospels, the word covenant's only one time. I mean, you just, you just read it. Um, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the word covenant never even shows up except in Luke chapter 1 where you just read it. And now we've got it seven times in Genesis chapter 9. And so if you find Genesis 9... It's significant. God does not repeat himself over and over and over without having a purpose. And so, in fact, if you go back to Genesis 6, 18, you'll see the, the first time God mentions his covenant to Noah properly. And um, he's, this is, he's telling Noah what I want you to do. And um, verse 18 of Genesis 6, But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons, and thy wife, and thy sons' wives with thee. So he says, I'm, I'm going to establish my covenant with you and your sons and their wives. Now go to chapter 9, and let's look at this covenant a little bit more. It's in here seven times. We're not going to go into great detail. But he, if you notice in verse 9, Genesis 9, 9, and God spake, uh, or, uh, yeah, verse 9, and I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. Now he said that in chapter 6, verse 18. I've got my covenant with you and your seed. Um, but look at verse 10 and with every living creature that is with you of fowl all those animals on the ark god's making a covenant with those animals and of every beast of the earth with you from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth and i will establish my covenant with you neither shall all flesh be cut off anymore by the waters of the flood neither shall there be any more flood to destroy the earth now god's gonna we know god's gonna burn the world the world up uh, it'll ex literally explode like a nuclear bomb, it looks like. But he's not going to flood it. And that's to me, I think, I'm not sure what's the big deal. God obviously thinks it's a big deal. He, he, may, he talks about it over, and you'll see him repeating himself here. Um, verse 12, and God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for a perpetual generations, I do set my bow in the cloud. That rainbow, that is a symbol of God's, a, a token. It's a reminder. God said, he said, I, I'm not going to flood the world. And here, look at this. And he put this rainbow up there. He said, every time I see that rainbow, it'll remind me, as if God needs reminded, it'll remind me that I'm not going to flood the world again. And it's probably to help us too. Uh, verse 13. I do set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a token for a covenant between me and the earth. Now what's the covenant with? You catch that? The earth. So we've got a covenant. Broken glasses. <laughs> we got. Better to have your glasses drop than to crush them. Um, a covenant with Noah and his sons and his sons' wives. And then it says a covenant with Noah and all the animals that are on the ark. And now he says this covenant with Noah his kids, the animals in the ark, and the earth itself. This is a big deal. And uh, this is the first time you see the word covenant talked about in any length at all. And um, if my glasses don't work, then we're going to do a lot of memory work here. Um, then look at um, verse 15. And I will remember my covenant 
which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh, and the bow shall be in the cloud, and I'll look upon it that I may remember the what kind of covenant? Everlasting. Now we're going to talk about several kinds of covenants. In the Garden of Eden, the word covenant is not used, but if we want to use that as a covenant, uh, how long are we going to have pain and childbearing and a wor- a, have to work for a living? All the way up till probably the kingdom, right? So it's not everlasting, but it's a long-term thing. You're not getting out of it. Um, and then the covenant with um, Noah, the rainbow, it is forever. It's a permanent covenant. Then there's the covenant with Abraham, the land. That's a forever. And we're gonna, we'll are gonna we have this charted in the next couple of weeks. And then the covenant with David about a king. Now, are we under the law of Moses? No, Colossians says that Jesus took the the uh, holy days and the feast days, and he nailed them to his cross, making a show of them openly. They're done. Um, Romans 10, 4, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. So you get up here, and it's done. Uh, the, the law came by Moses, John 1 says, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. There's a change. Something happens here. Something's different. That's the new covenant or the new testament that goes on, all right? So let's read on a little bit more because we've got to read all the covenants in this chapter. Verse 17. Uh, So in verse 16, there's the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature that is upon the earth. Verse 17, and God said to Noah, this is the token of the covenant that I've established between me and all flesh is upon the earth. Now, have, have you moms ever told your kids, maybe you said something like, I've told you over and over, or maybe you're a teacher, how many times do I have to tell you? Um, you dads ever have, you know, two, your kids get some tools to work in the yard and they don't put them away. I've told you over and over. And, and now none of you ever, none of you ever had that, right? That's what we're looking at here. God said the rainbow, it's a covenant. Um, I've got a covenant with you guys. The, the rainbow is a token. He said, and, and by the way, that token, that rainbow, that's a, and, and by the way, there's a covenant between me and you and You know why God repeats himself? Because we're not very bright. (laughs) Can I please have somebody give me an amen? And you got it, okay? You know, God's trying so hard to do that. Um, But anyway, so parents, don't feel bad if your kids don't catch it the first time through. Run back to Genesis chapter 3 just for a moment. And next week we're going to be, we'll be talking about land and some things that I think are going to be uh, less familiar, but I think, I think you know it, but I don't know if you've ever put it all into place. So Genesis chapter 3, and um, we're, we're looking here at this arrangement, covenant. Um, it was the, the product of sin. Uh, look at verse, uh, verse 14. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Genesis 3, 14, he's talking to the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Now, um, so if the curse says you're going to go on your belly, what was going on before that? He flew, he had legs, he, I don't know what he did, but uh, you ever see pictures in Greek mythology and ancient writings of flying serpents and how about dragons you ever see dragons anywhere you know there's a lot of stuff that shows up in fairy tales snow white not snow white one of those shows has a dragon in it sleeping beauty there you go there's a dragon in there and and you know where a lot of that stuff that's rooted in some real stuff you know, people say, oh, that, that couldn't be. Yes, it could be. God could do anything he wants. So what we're looking at here in the garden is what could have been and what is. And so we've got this serpent, and he's going to have to be on his belly. How'd you like to have been able to fly or run or have legs or whatever? Maybe they were like a mini- the giant minotaur lizards or whatever they call those lizards and now you have to slither along on your belly and people run over you with cars and anyway it's going to get worse than that when god throws him into the bottomless pit because you know in the book of revelation he calls him the dragon that old dragon the devil but uh now he goes to men and women first he talks with uh the woman in verse 16 unto the woman he said I will greatly multiply we, we, we i'm sorry we should probably i'm taking things for granted let's go back uh, to verse 
15, and I will put enmity, so he's talking to the, to the serpent or the devil here, I'll put enmity or a division or a, a, a fight between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. Now, why do they call it her seed? I'm not rhetorically speaking. I just want you to think for a minute. Um, the seed is the man, right? But Jesus didn't have an earthly seed. And so every tidbit of your Bible is right. Every little thing that people want to mess with and um, more, more than you can imagine, more than I can imagine. Uh, this is such an incredible book. Every detail is so profound. And so he says to the woman, your seed and his seed are going to have some problems. And the devil's seed is going to bruise Jesus's heel and Jesus is going to bruise his head. And in the, way, the, the, the Lord Jesus is going to win, obviously. This is not a battle between two equals hoping the good guy wins. This is God in the flesh, and he's going to, whenever he chooses, he'll destroy the wicked one. And we don't have to worry about that. Uh, so then to the woman, um, verse 16, to the woman he said, now, I'm going to be politically incorrect, probably should shut the internet off right here, because we're going to have all kinds of emotional issues going on. <laughs> YouTube's going to censor me. <laughs> verse 16, under the woman he said, now, here's what, what's going to happen. We, we had no problem with things happening to the serpent, right? So can't some things happen to the woman? No, oh, oh, everything, she's perfect. Wonder Woman, you know, one guy said in our day we had Superwoman. In your day you have, is that a woman? <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you what, it shows how young that guy was. In my day we had Superman. All right, we didn't even have Superwoman. The man was rescuing Lois Lane, the old day ones when they were decent. I don't know if they were decent. That was, that's a long time ago. I don't remember. Under the woman, he said, I'll greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. There's going to be grief in conception and childbearing. This is going to be sorrow. And, um, and I want you to notice the sorrow that comes. And then in sorrow a second time, thou shalt bring forth children. And so there's going to be difficulty in, in, in childbirth and in, in childbearing. And, and thy desire shall be to thy husband. That's just a statement. Um, it's not what it, remember, it's not what could have been. It's what is. And she said, you're just going to want to do it his way. And um, then he goes on, and he shall rule over thee. Now, that verse has not changed since it was written down. That's still there. Um, and that is, you say, well, you know what? All men aren't all that smart. No, they're not. They just got the job. You know, I've got, I've got people on my staff way smarter than me. I just got here first. <laughs> I got the best office. And um, I'm smart enough as a leader to know that my wife knows some things about my kids I don't. I'm smart enough as a employer to know that I've got teachers that know things about education I don't. I'm smart enough to know that everybody on my staff knows something I don't know. But the buck stops here, as is obvious. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, but, but you guys, whether it be in business or in your home, be smart enough to know just because you're the head and you may make the rules of what we are and aren't going to do, those people around you they know a lot. I, I, may be the, I may be the pastor and make the spiritual calls, but when the bus breaks down and I'm on it, the mechanic is in charge. Uh, that's just good sense. Um, best illustration, when I was, um, we were early in our marriage, uh, Josh, who's our youth director now, he was just little, and we don't believe in house-proofing a kid. Uh, we, kid we don't kid-proof the house. We house-proof the kid. We didn't move anything. We just taught him don't touch stuff. And a little flick of the finger or whatever. He didn't have to abuse a child or anything. But we, we, didn't, we didn't take things off shelves. And um, we're just not going to do that. Um, but one day he had grabbed something on a shelf. And I said no. And he pulled his hand back. And that's what he's supposed to do. And then he started to reach for it again. Well, that's time for a crucifixion, execution. And, and I started to get up. Uh, because I'm not going to say it twice. 
You that are raising children, don't say it twice. If you didn't mean it the first time, don't say it. And I, I was gonna, I was gonna go say, "Now, son," no, I wasn't gonna. But anyway, Mrs. Goddard said, "Wait, wait, wait, wait! Just wait a minute." And he reached up, and whatever I don't even know what it was, but he reached up, and then he turned it and put it exactly like it was before he touched it and took his hand off. That's the freak that kid was, even when he was little. <laughs> but see. I was smart enough to know that my wife's around him almost 24 seven and who cares who the head of the house is that lady knows some things I don't know. And I'm not stupid enough to think that I have the perfect understanding. Uh, it's like people, you read something once on Facebook and suddenly you know enough to judge the world. No, you're just an idiot like the rest of them who are parroting things they don't know anything about. Now, that's why I decided I can't have any part of social media. It's the biggest bunch of gossip, slanders, and, and unscriptural liars there are. Now, if you keep touch with your children or grandchildren or whatever, God bless you, do whatever you want. But I couldn't. I couldn't without. I had a pastor call me one day. He said, are you in social media? I said, no. He said, I can't. And I, I thought my church members were pretty good Christians until I saw their social media. And I said, forget <laughs> it. He said, I had to get off social media. I was, I was going to kick everybody out of the church or something. <laughs> but uh, so, uh, but, but see, God put the man in leadership as a curse, ladies. Right? Is that not what we're reading? He put the man in leadership as punishment to the lady for taking the fruit. You see, my husband's not all that smart. God knew that. That's why he put him in charge. <laughs> You didn't know it was going to be a marriage seminar tonight, did you? And listen now, mankind has always fought God's way. You know what? Men want to have enough money to not work. Can't the government just pay me and I'll sit home? No. That's a sorry way to live. I, I want to I be a millionaire so I can sit around the pool at 40 and not work the rest of my life. No, that's not. God says you need to work. If you gave me enough money now that I never needed a paycheck the rest of my life, I don't believe I'd change anything I do. For one, I love what I do. And for another, I'd probably get into all kinds of trouble. This is a part of the curse. It's, it's you're supposed to do it. You know, you, one of our friends back in Indiana, you know, some of you know the Cowlings, their son Keith was a little bit stubborn. And Keith gave his, had a little bit of an attitude about taking the garbage out. And it's, they had a long driveway from the house down to the street. And um, so his, uh, after dinner, his dad said, Keith, go outside. And he said, take the garbage to the street. So he took it down there. And he said, bring it back. He brought it back. He said, take it back down there. And he said, you keep doing that until I come out. And he's just going back and forth and back and forth. <laughs> now, if he'd have stopped, would he have been obedient? God said, this is punishment. All right, now it goes on. It got really sober in here. <laughs> Let's talk about men. All right, girls? <laughs> Let's get off the women. They carry the checkbooks. That's no, a joke. Nobody has a checkbook in here. Maybe a couple of us old people. I still write checks. Old-fashioned Baptist. Um, you look at one a week, one a week to the church. Verse 17, and to Adam, he said, because thou hast hearkened to the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying thou shalt not eat of it. Now the wrong here, fellas, he listened to the wrong advice. God said this, and the woman said that, and he listened to the wrong leader. He said, because you've done this and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying thou shalt not have eat of it, Cursed is the ground for thy sake. And notice sorrow again. Now we see sorrow a third time now. Sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. This silly generation. I just, I just don't feel fulfilled. And I just want to be happy. And why can't I be happy? Why can't I do what I want? Because you're on a cursed earth. Because it's a sin-cursed place. And God said you need to man up and work. And get up and go to work. And do the hard thing. And that's why kids ought to take algebra. And learn gerunds and participles. And write out sentences and paragraphs and papers. 
when I don't feel like writing, good, then you do it twice as much. Do it until you like it. And that's the kindergartners. <laughs> you know, my husband and I, we just go out a lot because I just don't feel like cooking. Do whatever you want. But guys, I'll tell you, I would marry a girl that can't cook. At least chocolate chip cookies and biscuits and gravy. <laughs> Tamales, lumpia, pancit. There's a few things you got to get out of there, right? But anyhow, a good green smoothie. <laughs> hey, we got it in our house, but, but we also got steak. Um, because thou shalt hearken the voice of thy wife, he says, thou shalt, thou shalt not eat of it. The cursed is the ground. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Sorrow. It, look, it is a hard life. And you do your children a grave injustice, giving them everything they want and making their world so protected and so nice and no one's ever going to be mean and nothing's ever going to be hard. Uh, this Sunday we're featuring Baptist boys. I love the Baptist boys. We've got our blue denim and lace going to come up Sunday morning in the church service and Baptist boys, just small groups of of specialized training and if I had a child third through sixth grade they would be in it and um, and I've been out there and watched those guys uh, well brother Steve were you Marine Corps where's Steve pleaded you were army oh I'm sorry for cussing uh, um, brother brother Mike Gallardo's Marine Corps and, and, and Steve was army and then they've got uh, Omero he wasn't military was he no he's just tough Mexican he just <laughs> He's just a big, beefy monster. And then Nathan Mowry brings the grace and suaveness into it. But, uh, man, I love seeing it marching. Calisthenics, um, skill tests from using electric drills to casting, a fishing lure. And uh, we want to develop manliness and strength and character. Why? Because part of this curse back here is life is hard. And if you raise your child thinking life's easy, you do them a grave injustice. And you also do an injustice to whoever they're going to marry. Because life's hard. And the sooner they learn to do hard things, the better off they are. Uh, just to be candid, I think that's why some of our immigrants that come to America, sometimes they work better. Sometimes they're better Christians when they get saved. Because it was hard where they came from. And they look at this soft Americans and uh, I was talking to Joel Paul, one of our members of decades, and he's back in South Carolina. He said they're building a garage, and he said they got Jethro and, and uh, you know, Bubba, and they got four or five guys out there. He said, if I'd have had two Mexican carpenters from Southern California, this thing would have been done a long time ago. <laughs> he said, these guys are so lazy. <laughs> I said, well, understand, everybody that has employed anyone in America feels that way right now. It's like, where did all the workers go? We got all these people who can't even count change out. What a mess we're in. But hard. Um, it's a part of the curse. And, um, you know, you may have some money and retire. And if you do, then you're probably going to get sick and spend the rest of your life traveling to the doctor. It's all good. And uh, let's talk. Let's pray. Father, bless us as we go. We're so grateful for a wonderful book and that it would teach us and that we would teach it to our children, our children's children. And we are grateful for our freedom in America. May we take take advantage of it, take this book and love it. May it be our best friend. And then may we talk about it. I pray you'd help us to get some tracks in our pocket and witness to people this week. Pray for soul winning tomorrow and Saturday in the bus.